Jonathan Dwyer with you. Thank you for joining us for another Sunday sermon. It's very good to have your company. We're also very excited as well as a church because very soon we're going to be able to meet together. So for our regular people, I want you to know that we're working on a plan at the moment. We're going to release that plan and we're going to look forward to seeing each and every one of you back in our worship building very soon. So that's very exciting news and we thank God that in Queensland in particular, the, the virus has been suppressed quite to quite low levels and that has obviously allowed the Queensland government a, a bit more room in terms of lifting some of the restrictions. So of course our focus was on the church and being able to gather and we are very excited that uh, this stage of heavy restrictions is going to come to an end very soon. So we look forward to having people in our worship building once again and an exciting day that will be. Well, as you can see, I framed the shot with the cross in view. As I've said in past videos, I always like to have the cross of Jesus Christ in view in my life. That helps to gain perspective. And that's also an even more important point now when a lot of the things that the world has clung on to, materialism, capitalism, uh, going to pubs and clubs, all of the world's focus has all of a sudden as a result of this virus been ripped away from them and so what's left for a lot of people there's not a lot left and so that's why they've been really distraught through this period but for us as believers we always have our faith our faith is anchored in God we have the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ always in view and we thank God daily for the fact that his son went to that cross he shed his blood he died he rose again and through him we can have the gift of eternal life. Well, I'm here to you today to speak, and uh, it's great, it's a great blessing to be able to speak from God's Word. And I've broken this sermon into two parts. Originally, I was going to preach it in one part, but if I did so, it would have been about an hour long. And so for some people, once you get to that hour mark, it starts to get a bit hard, a bit heavy to endure. So I have broken it down into two distinct parts, and that hopefully will make it easier for people to digest. Well, if you were to ascribe a title to a sermon, and I always like, as personal preference, to ascribe titles to sermons. It helps me, and I believe it helps the congregation as well to know which theme we are following. And today, the title for part one and part two of this sermon is The Sufficiency of Scripture. So both parts, because they're broken, it will be a slightly shorter sermon than we're used to across these two parts, but as I said, hopefully much easier to digest. Well, if you've been an observer of society, particularly over the last decade, what's become evident that in this world, everyone carries a label. Now, as we all well know, despicably, the Nazi regime, they made the Jews wear the yellow star of David. And what most don't know is that this practice didn't actually begin with the Nazis. Many people think it did or assume it did, but it actually didn't. The Jews of Europe were legally compelled to wear badges or distinguishing garments because some were forced to wear these pointed hats at least as far back as the 13th century. Now, this practice continued through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance period but was largely phased out during the 17th and 18th centuries. And then with the coming of the French Revolution and the emancipation of Western European Jews throughout the 19th century, the wearing of badges was thankfully abolished, but it was the Nazis who simply reinstated this practice. So that's where it came from. So at the time, the German government's policy of forcing Jews to wear identifying badges was but one of the many psychological tactics that the Nazis employed aimed at isolating and dehumanizing the Jews of Europe. And what that did was it directly marked them as inferior to everybody else. And unfortunately, we know the results of that. That led to their continued isolation. It led then to deportation. And unfortunately for 6 million Jews, it did lead to death. So, the practice of labelling still continues today. People mightn't be forced to wear an identifying badge, but the rise of social media has really allowed people to still affix labels to other people. 
They're targeted, they're marked, and they're labelled, not in the physical realm, but in the digital realm. So you even have the threat of deportation in the form of being banned from social media if your views don't align with those of tech corporations, and these are very liberal tech corporations, or of course any of the other social media mob, as we call it. So what Christians, what, what Christians are finding now is that it's becoming increasingly difficult not only to operate freedom of religion in the physical world, but also in the digital realm as well, because some Christians are really hunted down, not only by the secular unbelieving world, but unfortunately there are a lot of Christians who are very liberal in their views, who side very much with the world, who are hunting down and really targeting some of these Christian views on the internet. So uh, unfortunately it's become one of the great stains on our society that we had physical oppression, we had physical abuse, and that's now taken itself into the digital realm as well. So for a lot of people, we just can't escape. No one can escape this, this issue of bullying and abuse. And it's very sad that it not only happens in the physical world, but also in the digital as well. So for many of us as believers, we wear a label that the world and some other Christians have given us. And, and I guess one of the, the most descriptive labels they like to give, which is derogatory to us in their mind, is that they call us right-wing evangelical Christian fundamentalists. Right-wing evangelical Christian fundamentalists. So there's a few components to that, and we'll go through that in a moment. Of course, the right-wing element of that term relates to politics, because Christians often vote conservatively or to the right, and we are branded in the political realm as right-wing. But of course, as I said, that's politics, and we're not here to discuss politics. We're going to leave that topic for another day. Instead, what I want to focus on today is why churchianity refers to us as fundamentalists. Now, in case you thought I misspoke and said churchianity instead of Christianity, I did mean to say churchianity, and it's a modern term, and it's important for you to understand what churchianity means, particularly in the context of this message. So many aren't familiar with the term, but churchianity is rife in the world today, and it is a growing problem, not only for the world, but also for the true Bible-believing church as well. Well, in churchianity, unfortunately, God's redemption story has been repackaged into some self-help program that has some Christian flavour, but unfortunately it's stripped out salvation's true meaning. So Christianity teaches this watered-down, man-centred gospel of self-help, prosperity and self-worship. But because this is a false message and it's broadcast under the guise of spirituality and it's dotted with Bible verse fragments, Many are actually fooled into believing that churchianity is the gospel that Jesus Christ taught. Uh, but that's simply not the case. And I'll, I'll go through the reasons why. See, churchianity is most attractive to those who do not know their Bibles and, quite frankly, have no impetus or, or no desire to learn the Bible or to read the Bible or study the Bible. So, Churchianity, what it does is that assures its people, and these are people that, as I said, they don't read their Bible, they don't study their Bible for themselves. So churchianity as a whole assures these people that, yeah, you're right with God, you just keep turning up and we'll feed you these sermons, you keep these certain rules, you come into these church buildings and you're fine with God. That's what churchianity does. It keeps these people locked in a perpetual state of this self-help, this self-reliance, without exploring what the scriptures say. So unfortunately what that does is churchianity produces what we refer to as nominal Christians. And unfortunately they do fall under the same condemnation as the religious leaders of Jesus' day. And if you refer to Mark 7 in your Bible, uh, he had said this, partly quoting from Isaiah. This people honours me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups, and many other such things you do. He said to them, 
all too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. Do you understand that? What he is saying is that people, and particularly people in churchianity, they're throwing out what God had declared in his word as worship, and they are simply introducing their own forms or traditions of worship, and they're calling that worship. But that's not worship. Sometimes we get too hung up on the fact that we pull together all of these programs, and we do this, and we do that for God. But when was the last time you truly consulted the Bible and understood what God considers worship? Because sometimes as we gather around, we're really just worshipping ourselves, self-promoting, showing others what we can do for God. But what we need to be able to declare to others is what God has done for us. That is the importance of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, that God took human flesh, came to this earth, and he died for us. That is what we should be promoting. We shouldn't be promoting man at all. Because in man, there is nothing. There is no salvation in man. There is only salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ and his life-saving blood. That is the message that the church should be promoting. See, it can be said in this world, lack of religion is never the problem. Lack of truth, that is the problem. But unfortunately, we have all of these religious organisations, but there's very little truth in them. But this is what happens. Sinful beings will always seek that which validates our opinions and our agendas. That's why we look for other people like-minded to be able to validate what we think or what we believe. And this is the whole problem in social media at the moment as well, is that people surround themselves in their Facebook, their Instagram, their YouTube, with others who agree with them. And then if someone doesn't agree, they don't know how to handle that. They've lost the art of debate. They've lost the understanding that just because someone disagrees with you, it doesn't mean they hate you at all. It just means they disagree with your views. But the problem in churchianity is that when they supposedly find validation stamped with a Bible verse, then they feel justified in rejecting the difficult path of discipleship in favour of some glitzy promise. And that is why, unfortunately, there are so many people falling away from the true church today. See, because it gives the appearance of being truth and faith, churchianity challenges true discipleship as an attractive counterfeit. Churchianity wants to look good sitting in the pews, but it doesn't demand real sacrifice. Churchianity carefully avoids sins while tolerating other more socially acceptable sins. Churchianity encourages religiously minded people to make half-hearted, costless decisions that offer false assurance, but never ever result in the true transformation of a person. So unfortunately, churchianity represents a great threat to biblical Christianity because biblical Christians are leaving the true church in droves to chase after these glitzy promises made by churchianity that you can have health and you can have wealth if only you give or only you do this or do or follow a certain rule. But those promises simply aren't there. They're false and empty promises made by churchianity. So let's examine some tenets of biblical Christianity. And historically there are five, but in my view there are actually six. So let's go through them. First of all, the Bible is literally true and inerrant. That, that is to say, without error and free of all contradictions. Number two, the virgin birth and the deity of Jesus Christ is true. Jesus Christ was conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, and he is the Son of God, fully man and fully divine in hypostatic union. Three, a belief in the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ on the cross. This is very important. Salvation is only obtained through faith in the person and work of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Number four, a belief in the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. As we know, on the third day, Jesus rose again and he now sits at the right hand of God the Father. This is where the claims of the Jehovah's Witnesses are false. 
They believe that Jesus was just the best man that ever lived. And so when it comes time to remember him at Easter time, as we often do, the, Jesus, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they'll hold a memorial for Jesus. Now that is distinctly different than, than what we do in holding a Resurrection Sunday service because we believe and the Scriptures declare that the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father. It is vitally important to the gospel message that Christ rose from the dead because he overcome, he overcame death and through his shed blood, through his death, burial and resurrection, we too are going to be raised up into new life. Well, number five, a belief in the authenticity of Jesus' miracles as declared in the Scriptures. And number six, as I said, number six, this isn't historically a tenet of biblical Christianity, but I added in there, this is my own personal view, that we should also believe in the rapture of the church and the literal pre-millennial return of Jesus Christ to rule and reign on this earth for a literal 1,000 year period as declared in the book of Revelation. So what this does is that it essentially comes down to two opposing views. We have theological modernism on one side and we have Christian fundamentalism on the other. Or, let me put it quite simply this way. Do you believe that scripture should be reinterpreted at certain intervals in accordance with man's growing wisdom? Or do you believe in the sufficiency and the inerrancy of the scriptures? See, we worship a God who has revealed himself through the Bible. That's how we can get to know God and his method of salvation and, of course, what he has planned for the future. In part, we don't know all of prophecy, but God has given us a small glimpse of what is in our prophetic future. So we don't have the right to really speculate or modify or reinterpret the scriptures to suit our wishes or the so-called cultural standards of today. We don't have that power. We are mankind and we are sinful mankind. God is God. He is the author of this book. He is the author and finisher of our faith. And at no time, under no circumstances, do we have the ability or the power to rewrite the scriptures, to leave anything out of the scriptures, to add anything to the scriptures, because this is God's declared word in full. And our role as Bible-believing Christians is to read it, study it, believe it and preach it. So where did this problem all begin? Or more to the point, since these principles that I've just gone through, the six principles, because they are really what every Christian should believe, where did this separation of ideas truly come from? Well, if we go back to the late 19th century and the early 20th century, Conservative Christian leaders were growing concerned that moral values were being eroded by modernism. In other words, people were moving towards a belief that human beings, rather than God, had the power to create, improve and to reshape their environment with the aid of scientific knowledge. It meant that what was happening is that science was then becoming the backbone of faith instead of the inerrant word of God. And at the same time, the inerrancy of the scriptures was also being attacked through this German-led higher criticism movement. Uh, that's something we don't have time to study today, but you might have heard of the higher criticism movement. If you haven't, I'd encourage you to study it. There are many reliable sources out there, and you can see why this really attacked and eroded some people's confidence in the inerrancy of the scriptures. Well, Many liberal Christians in particular view fundamentalism as anti-intellectual and that Christians who adopt these views are very closed-minded. But in actual fact, the rise of fundamentalism in the 1920s in particular was a reaction against the loss of biblical teaching due to the growing acceptance of liberalism in the period before it. Uh, but coupled with lib liberalism was also modernism working its way into Christianity as well. But there was a third, a third issue that had come upon the church at that time, and that was Darwinism. See, the church itself, it was being invaded by false teachers. And so it was necessary for Christians to be reminded of the need for true doctrine, proper teaching, and godly conduct. 
That's why fundamentalism started to be raised up again as fundamental teaching in the 1920s because it was a reaction uh, amongst all of those other issues, all of those other beliefs that had been introduced into the church. And the church needed to be purged from them again. So in Jude 1, if you've read the book of Jude, very short book, just prior to the book of Revelation, I'd encourage you to read it because it does give some wonderful exhortations, particularly in relation to this issue around contending for the faith. And in Jude 1, 3, we read a very important statement. It reads this, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Who are the saints? Us, Bible-believing Christians. We are the saints, people who have been saved by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, as Jude alluded to in the opening of that passage, he had originally meant to write a letter about salvation to his friends, but he changed his plans when he learned about false teachers who had secretly made their way into the church. And this is what happens. They make their way in secretly. They don't come in all guns blazing because they know that they will never get anywhere. They come in secretly, surreptitiously, underneath to undermine and erode confidence in the faith. And so because of the influence of false teachers at this time, now this is not long after Christ uh, had ascended into heaven, after Christ's ascension, uh, and they were already facing the issue of false teachers. So, and we can see over many generations and thousands of years since Christ's ascension that the church has battled this continually. It's been a continual problem. And that's why it's, uh, it's good to continually focus on it because we always have to be ready on guard to purge a lot of these issues and a lot of these views from the church so that we can be contending for the faith. But must I say, or might I say, contending for the faith is not just a vigorous defence of the Christian faith, but it's also an advancement of the gospel as well. If you treat it very much like you're defending your position in a fort, you can't just sit there defending. What you also must do is advance. And so God calls us to take the, the gospel to all people, to all nations. That's an advancement in the Great Commission. It's not just sitting back and, and waiting for the enemy to come, but we've got to go out and approach the enemy and overcome the enemy. And we can only do that by God's wonderful grace and by God's strength. But what I say as well, that needs to be reinforced by obedience because we can't be preaching this and not living it. Otherwise, uh, our witness is meaningless and we're going to become a stumbling block to those who are really looking for the path of salvation. So obedience, we've touched on obedience many times in past sermons, and it really is a theme that you need to keep coming back to, reevaluating your life and seeing if you are being obedient in the word, in the Lord. Well, here we come to the real nucleus of Satan's attack against the inerrancy of the scriptures and against doctrine and dispensationalism. He wants to confuse the path to salvation. That is his sole goal with religion. As I said before, the world's problem isn't lack of religion, it's lack of truth. There's always been religion in the world and there's likely always to be religion in the world, particularly we see that in the tribulation period, this one world church which is opposed to God. There's always religion, but there's not always truth. And that's why it's really important for us, us who understand the Bible, who know the truth of the Bible, to be declaring the truth. Now, this isn't just about declaring the truth to an unrepentant world. As I said, and this is the basis of this sermon, this truth needs to be reinforced in churches because unfortunately, churches have fallen victim to lies. And so we need to constantly reinforce the truth of the scriptures in churches with Christians so that they really understand the truth of the word and can be ready themselves to defend it also. Well, how many souls are going to be unsaved? How many souls are going to be lost to a devil's hell because there are false teachers in the church making the path of salvation harder for people to find? See, God's word and the gift of eternal life, they have infinite value. We know that as saved believers. We, we've felt the wonderful majesty of salvation 
and the deep and wonderful reassurance that we're going to go into God's kingdom in the future. And that's a wonderful promise that we can rest on. But unfortunately, there are some false teachers who aren't teaching that. They don't teach the gospel. They don't teach the only method of salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, they are condemning many, many people to a devil's hell because of their reluctance to teach the word. And so, as Jude had alluded to, what we've been entrusted with is the truth of God's word, the truth of the gospel. And it's our mandated duty to protect the truth. Why? Again, if I didn't make the point clear, the point is to make the way of salvation clear to people, to remove the obstacles, to remove the false teaching, and just to really reinforce to people that the path to salvation is very easy. It's to the cross. It's to the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what we need to be reinforcing. We need to cast aside this prosperity gospel. We need to cast aside this health gospel. We need to cast aside the self-help programs. And we need to get back to preaching the pure truth that the way of salvation is to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Well, over the last few decades in particular, many of the attacks against the inerrancy of Scripture had come from the scientific community as well. And of course, Satan has used this to his advantage. He's going to use everything and everyone to get an advantage in the church and against God. As a fellow by the name of Charles Lyle, he had popularised the idea known as uniformitarianism. That is, that instead of a worldwide flood causing rock layers, he proposed that it was a slow and gradual process over millions of years. We've heard this many times over. And so using uniformitarianism as an example, David Hume then convinced many that belief in miracles was foolish because, and I quote, Wise men should not believe in miracles because the probability for the uniformity of nature was always higher than the probability of an exception to the laws of nature. Does that make sense? If not, let me put it to you this way. He's, he believes because nature is so predictable, we should trust in nature's ways rather than a seemingly miraculous event. When we read the Bible, we know that Christ performed many miracles. That is part of our faith. We understand that God is almighty. God is all powerful. That's part of our faith and we reinforce that part of our faith in recounting the Bible stories. Well, it could be said that unfortunately, mistakes were made amongst church leaders at that time by failing to adequately respond to these attacks. And so unfortunately, rather than contending for the faith, Many pastors and theologians had then thought they needed to fit this millions of years theory into what the Bible had said. And so they tried to reconcile the Genesis text with this other millions of years theory. And then they, they came up with what's known as the gap theory. And that is that the theory that God created the earth and then there were millions or billions of years when God just left the earth untouched in order for it to evolve naturally. And that's not what the Genesis text says at all. And this is where we get to this one major flaw in the gap theory, particularly where it concerns theology. There would have been death before sin entered into the world. And we know that is not the case. So that one sentence immediately disproves the gap theory, yet People took hold of it and they ran with it and they tried to reinterpret Genesis by fitting this gap theory into it. Instead of just reading Genesis literally, using what God has written literally, understanding how, how almighty and powerful God is, how difficult is it to understand that God could create the world in six literal days? He's God almighty. Of course he can do it. It's not up to us to question or to try to look for other explanations of how the word could be reconciled with the scientific views, our role is to simply espouse the word of God as it is written. See, Charles Spurgeon, the prince of preachers, 
Uh, we all know him. Most people might be surprised to know that he also believed the earth might have been millions of years old. And as brilliant as Spurgeon was, he wasn't a complete theologian. And in particular, he tended to avoid committing in two key areas. Eschatology, the study of end times events, and geology. Now, they may have well been just a byproduct of his time. Let's not forget the age in which Spurgeon lived in. So we're blessed. We have a lot of information at our fingertips now where we can reinforce the truths of the Bible. Uh, but, you know, in Spurgeon's day, he might have had access to a lot of geological data and, uh, and the brilliant minds of scientists, particularly Christian scientists, who can really show us that the, the worldwide flood is the explanation for uh, mountains and caves and valleys and, and so on and so forth. So we're very thankful for that. So we can't be too critical of Spurgeon, uh, particularly since he was one of the greatest preachers of all time. He led countless numbers of people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, so what it highlights, though, is how important proper teaching is. See, the gap theory was at its peak when Spurgeon's ministry uh, and so due to the fact that the teaching of the correct biblical account wasn't predominant in churches at the time, it of course then led him to adopt uh, an element of this gap theory in his preaching and teaching as well. So as I said, because the Genesis account wasn't being preached in churches at the time, it did cause preachers to slightly modify how they were preaching, how they were, they were teaching. So this is why, as I said, it's really, really important for churches to understand what they're teaching and make sure they're teaching the word of God as it is written. Because if you deviate, you're likely to deviate into error. That's why it's always very important to stick to the biblical account and stick to the biblical truth. Now, I raise this for a particular Point. I didn't raise it to disparage Spurgeon. As I said, I'm not being critical of Spurgeon. He was a wonderful preacher and uh, he did great things for God. But I raised this for one particular issue. To this day, because Spurgeon said it, people say they believe it. Now understand the reference there. People are saying that they believe Spurgeon over what the Bible says. Now, I don't care whether Spurgeon said it, I don't care whether McGee said it, I don't care whether Billy Graham said it, I don't care if Dean DeWire said it. You need to go back to the Bible. You need to go back to the Word of God. And if the Word of God says it, you believe it. If a, if a preacher says it and that contradicts what the Bible says, you've got to believe the Bible. And this is the point and this is the problem in churchianity. The adherents of churchianity they don't read their Bibles. They don't study their Bibles. They don't know their Bibles. And so some of these preachers in churchianity, they're really holding their people hostage because they're espousing these views that might, might not be right, might not be biblical, but because their adherents don't know any better, they, they can't rise up against this false teaching. And that's a real problem. That's a real problem in churches today. Now, these teachers, they might, they might know their teaching error. They might not know their teaching error. But the point is, the Bible calls us to be good Bereans. Each of us is accountable for studying the Bible of our own accord, using our own time, our own intellect, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to study the word for ourselves. And if a preacher, and I always say this, this to my people, if I ever say something that you don't agree with or that's not in the Bible, then you're very welcome to come and approach me and ask me why. Because in my view, no one is ever 100% accurate. There might be areas where we have small things wrong. Not, I'm not saying that we deliberately do this, but sometimes we just make a genuine mistake. And so it's always important for preachers to be held accountable. Now, I'm not saying that we nitpick and we, we look for error every time someone speaks, but what I am saying is that that's the importance of every Christian understanding the Word of God so that they can enjoy a preacher's teaching, they can enjoy sermons, but they're also making sure that that aligns with what 
God's word says. Because as I said in, ch in the example given about churchianity, if you've got a group of people who are just lapping up what the preacher says and it's all lies and, and deception, that's not a worship service. And so we must always be on guard, ready to contend for the truth of God. You now, going back to the gap theory, might, many might say, well, what's the problem? Surely it doesn't matter if we believe whether the earth is 6,000 years old or millions of years old. If we just believe roughly what scientists say and the Bible says, surely isn't that good enough. Uh, regrettably, it does matter a lot. And it mattered a lot when this particular issue came up because what happened was that this compromise paved the way for the next major assault on the inerrancy of the scriptures. And as I alluded to before, where did this assault come from? It came through a pen. It came through the pen of Charles Darwin. In fact, the renowned atheist evolutionist Ernest Mayer said, and I quote, the Darwinian revolution began when it became obvious that the earth was very ancient rather than having been created only 6,000 years ago. This finding was the snowball that started the whole avalanche. Let me put it to you this way. In the 1800s, they were happy to accept that the Bible was inerrant in respect of much of its moral portions, but not its historical. And this is now the key issue. People then started to believe the historical portion was untrue. And therefore, if that was untrue, how long before people started to believe the moral position of the Bible was also untrue? So people then no longer believed in the in any portion of the Bible, whether the moral or the historical, primarily because the authenticity of its historical account was allowed to be eroded. And so this is what happened. Destroy the credibility, credibility of the Bible as an historical document and you sow the seeds of the rejection of the moral teachings of the Bible, not only outside the church, but also inside the church as well. And so when we allow the world to write truths for us, we are bringing about our own delusion. We need to read the word, believe the word, and preach the word as it is now, not how man interprets it. We don't need science to factually verify the Bible. The Bible stands alone as its own authority and the singular source of truth. Yes, it's good when we have archaeological evidence that underpins the truth of the Bible. There's a fellow by the name of Randall Price, I believe his name is, who is also an archaeologist. And so he takes his study of archaeology and the Bible and he shows us great truths that are from the Bible that have been replicated in the natural world. Uh, so it's great when that happens, but it doesn't need to happen because the Bible itself is its own authority and its own truth. Well, that brings us to the end of part one of this two-part series called The Sufficiency of Scripture. And it's our prayer as we close that the Holy Spirit would work in the life of all Christians so that those who are unwilling to accept the whole truth of the Bible or believe that there are some areas where the truth needs to be changed, as I said before, to fit in this millions or millions of years or gap theory, it's our prayer that these Christians would come to accept the word as it's written and come to know the Bible as inerrant and infallible. And as that great hymn says, I will plant my feet on its firm foundation because the Bible stands. And so to exercise faith, we must be ready to stand upon its truth, believe its truth, and also to preach its truth.